So um, welcome to Feminist Question, oh, not for, to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about women of ideas and what men have done to them by Dale Spender. We're going to discuss um, with Emma Dalton, Joe Brew, that's me, and Dorothea Anderson. And um, Emma is not yet here, so we'll start off the discussion with uh, Joe Brew and Don Dorothea Anderson. Um, I'm just going to check that everything's up all right and we have got everything. Yes, so um, this book by Dale Spender is, I'm just getting up the um, thing. So it's called Women of Ideas and What Men Have Done to Them. It was written in 1982. It covers 140 ish um, women of ideas and what men have done to them from 1640 Afra Ben to 1982 when the book was published uh, Germaine Greer. There's a list in the back of the book of those women who are discussed and covered. Now um, on the front of the book, this is a copy of the book here, um, uh, there's a quote um, which says, this is no string of biographies, it is a holistic study of feminist political theory. Um, so we'll, we're going to talk about how, um, what comes through from the political theory and what the ideas from these women are and how they've come through. Um, Spender's of other books by Dale Spender are Man Made Language, Invisible Women, Mothers of the Novel, and there are many others uh, that you could look for. Um, her work is said to be a major contribution to the recovery of women writers and theorists and to the documentation of the continuity of feminist activism and thought. Dale Spencer was born in 1943. She's an Australian feminist scholar, teacher and writer and consultant. She is still alive, which is great. And so, and, and living in Australia. And her sister writes some great stuff about her in this book, Not Dead Yet, which is published by Spinifex Press. So to, um, so there's a, a really nice bit about Dale Spender and you can find stuff online. So I'm gonna hand over to Dorothea now to talk a bit about why we chose the book and why the book's so important. I mean, the major thing that made me want to sort of discuss this book now was um, in the chat when we when Man Made Language was discussed um, a few weeks ago, somebody in the in the chat commented commented that Dale Spender's work was outdated. And I just found that, I don't know, sad, ironic, frustrating, or all of those that the woman who wrote the book about how women are um, made invisible, how their knowledge is dismissed and, you know, calling it outdated is, is one of the techniques for doing that. Um, you know, I just, found, I just found that really um, annoying and thought, well, this book needs to be um, better known so that we can understand some of the techniques that men use to hide women's knowledge. And one of the things that um, Del Spender is really clear about in this book is that, uh, one of the techniques that patriarchy uses against women is to make our knowledge invisible. They, they control knowledge. And so it is really about a theory of, of knowledge, about how men control knowledge and, and women's resistance to that. Um, so I just wanted to read a, a quote that, that sort of sets that off and I found quite um, poignant, really. But it says, um, it's, it's well to remember that we are not the first generation, and she means women of the, the second wave, to recognise that we've been programmed to the invisibility of women. We're not the first generation to discover that women have had their intellectual and creative energy and efforts taken away. Virginia Woolf went back and constructed the tradition of women's ideas and contribution. Before her, it was Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and 50 years before her, it was Margaret Fuller. We could simply be part of a tradition of lost and found, unless and until we have control over our own work and knowledge and are then in a position to ensure the transmission of that tradition from one generation to the next. 
I do not think we're any closer to achieving this than were our foremothers. I have no illusions. And she says, OK, she's got a publishing contract for this book and it may well sell. But so did the books of those other women. And they they still got lost. And I think we we have come very close to that. Um, you know, Del Spender was one of the women that helped to establish women's studies in universities. Um, but of course, the patriarchy reacted to that, turned it into gender studies. And we've now got a sort of, you know, academic feminism that doesn't have women in it. And so I think it's really important that um, WDI is hosting these, these webinars and that women are sharing that knowledge and talking about these books and making sure that they're, they're not forgotten and, you know, encouraging women to, to read them again. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll just uh, sort of come in there on that. That mm -hmm. uh, I I didn't know that I'd heard of Dale Spender and mm -hmm. I'd never read any of her work. Mm -hmm. And the Man Made Language book, uh, women were saying just in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. oh, that's a good book. Mm -hmm. um, and I got it and didn't read it mm -hmm. until it came up on this radical mm -hmm. feminist perspective series, and. Um, I'm lucky enough to sometimes talk to Sheila Jeffries, who has taught women's studies and has been an activist feminist, uh, seems uh, knows pretty much every book that's been written. Mm -hmm. And she mentions uh, in a chat or in a group that I was um, involved in that women of ideas and what men have done to them is a good book. So I uh, luckily I have that link. So I bought the book and started reading it and just blown away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is amazing. But we we need to do more than just have these lucky chances of individuals sharing uh, our, the important books. So it is, I think it's great that we're start, we've done this series and we're doing it to say, to, to sort of consolidate that sharing of important books and ideas so it can get out really widely. And there's, so, there's so much to be done, but it feels great to be in that tradition um, that we're picking up Dale Spender's book and um, and having a look at it. By way of introduction, do you want to say another thing before, and then I'll I'll talk about the first bit of the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm not sure what else to, <laughs> what else to say at the moment. Um, just that it 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 sounds a bit dry. Oh, it's you know it's about all these women. Some of them are quite you know sort of back from from three hundred years ago. But it is a really easy read. It's it's a long book. Um, so it's possibly not something, it's not something you can read over a weekend. It might be something to, to dip into. But all the women are so interesting and they did so many, you know, that it's really eye-opening what they actually wrote about. And one of the um big things that she she says is constantly saying, look, this woman was saying this, you know, 150 or more years ago. And we thought, you know, in the 1960s to 80s, we thought we were the first to say it. But actually, women were writing, um, you know, about male violence against women. They were they were um, uh, attacking prostitution and the exploitation of women in prostitution. They were talking about marriage and how it's harm harmful to women, you know, which is what I was planning to sort of talk about um, a bit later. It is just there's there's just so much in it and, and the political activity. So, you know, also, you know, it brings in the key um, women involved in the struggle for the vote, both in, in America and in, in the UK. Um, I mean, it does concentrate on women in you know, in, in England, you know, the UK and, and America. Um, which I think is 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 fair enough. Um, you know, obviously she speaks English. It, it would be a bit much to ask her to go off and research all the women in in other parts of the world. But it does cover a whole lot, and it does help you challenge things when they say, you know, oh, that you know they're all just concerned about middle class, or they were not. Um, and only interested in legal equality and the vote. They weren't interested in, um, you know, sort of sexuality, marriage, violence, um, or all those other things. It, it, I just found found it a really interesting. It's so eye-opening. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to um, start off and tell uh, everybody about the beginning bit of the book. So the, here's the book. And this is this is how big it is. It's 700 yeah. pages. But you can buy it um, quite very easily. And it costs things like £3.20 or £4.50. Uh, Second-hand copies mm -hmm. are available. And uh, so it's 
really recommended to get them. Now, the the first, it, the introduction to the book says, why didn't I know? And she says, she's part of the, she, in the 70s, she was part of the uh, second wave, that wave of uh, the women's uh, liberation movement. And she said, many of us began to ask whether we were the first generation of women to have felt this way. And then she looked at it and realised, of course, that they weren't part of the first generation, although that that is where they started thinking possibly where the first lot then she started thinking right okay these women exist why didn't I know and why didn't we know and so this is a major question in the book it, she's not just giving us the resources and links to these 140 women who have written very, very coherently and uh, brilliantly about their lives and the oppression by, by men. But she's all the way through it doing this questioning, this sort of metacognition or sort of above the narrative of saying, what's been done to these women? What are the techniques that shut women up, that hide them, that uh, disappear their ideas? How do they get pushed out? How do the men make sure that they are dismissed and not known to the next generation? And this happens, it's it's great because um, for every writer, she looks at the ways that that writer was dismissed by men and undermined by men. And there are a range of different techniques <clears throat> which are very interesting to read about. Then um, she, another question, <clears throat> she says, um, this is central to our understanding of patriarchy. Why were women of the of present cut off from women of the past and how was this achieved? And she's saying it's, it's vital for us to become connected, to not get cut off. And this is a political act of us to know our links to women in the past. So that's great at the beginning. Then she says and, uh, in this introduction, patriarchy requires that any conceptualization of the world in which men and their power are a central problem should become invisible and unreal. So what she's saying is that it's needed by patriarchy that these women writers in the book became become invisible and that younger women and the current generations do not know about them, that they are invisible and they're unreal and that there are a range of ways that they are um, un unknown. Another thing she says in the introduction, which is, is interesting, is saying, so before we begin, we find the world weighted in favour of men. For centuries, they have been consulting each other, developing their view of the world and encoding a language to embody and construct their meaning in which they are central and in which all else, including women, is defined in relation to them. Um, and she says in order, she says a bit more about that. And then she says in order to become members of the society in which they hold sway, we must learn their rules. We must learn that we are women and that we do not occupy the privileged position men do. We do not count as much and we don't have the same human needs. And yet we must also learn that these conditions of our existence are not open to discussion. So <clears throat> um, this is exactly uh, I guess all of our experience is that we we find that we are outsiders, we find that we're outside knowledge and if we do try to make contributions to knowledge um, that those are dismissed in a range of different ways or silenced or people pretend they can't hear them uh, but in one way or another they are unvalued. Now um, she's she says she's going to pick that apart and explain <clears throat> and uh, Another thing she says in the introduction is it is men, not women, who control knowledge. And I believe that this is an understanding we should never lose sight of. It's because men control knowledge that we do not know our traditions as women. Um, and that then, I mean, there's so many good insights in here, but then she says, oh, good. Emma's here. So Emma, um, uh, if you could turn your camera on and join, that would be perfect. So I'll just take a break to. <laughs> so. Um, it's almost definitely my fault, but I neither Dorothea nor I told Emma that there was an hour change that uh, in the UK. So 
um, which is uh, really our fault and we're so sorry, but Emma, thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, sort of, uh, and so we've started. We're we're online. We've oh started. yes, sorry, I thought it, I thought it was me. I thought it was. Oh no, 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 no. I thought. <laughs> no, but, it's yeah. the patriarchy's fault. It's the patriarchy's yeah. fault. They're they're denying us access to knowledge. But we we're we're, oh. we're on the bit where I'm doing the introduction to the first thing. So, um, so it's uh, it's it's men who control this knowledge, and then they control which women. Who, are allowed to be heard. So they say, if they like what we produce, they will appropriate it. If they can use what we produce, even against us, they will take it. If they do not want to know, they will lose it. Um, but rarely, if ever, will they treat it as they treat their own. So uh, this theorizing and these insights that are coming from this very close analysis of the, la of the 140 women over the last 400 years, um, gives lots of insight to today because we see it happening over and over again. Um, she, she really urges us as part of our feminist activism to construct our own alternative meanings and traditions where we are no longer invisible, unreal, non-existent, and that our experience where we centre ourselves uh, is obviously completely valid, but to really uh, keep that tradition going. And so I think I, I think she would be very pleased that we're, we're sort of holding the baton now. We're taking up the baton uh, from uh, all, through all of these different women, but we're in our own way. We're doing this by being here and discussing these ideas. Um, right, so she says these women and their ideas constitute a political threat and they are censored. That's, uh, she's very, very clear that this is politics and we are a threat. And uh, that's, that's nice. And she, you know, she's pleased with it saying, look, we're gonna do this. Um, she said that, she quotes Adrian Rich uh, in a 1980 uh, article where she says, the entire history of women's struggle for self-determination has been muffled in silence over and over. And that Adrian Rich says that, um, this is one of the ways that women's work and thinking have been made to seem sporadic, errant, orphaned of any tradition of its own. And then back to uh, Dale Spender's words, we say we have no visible past, no heritage, our experience of existing in a void. And it's it's just a wonderful book to read it because you see we're not in a void and you really see how intent the patriarchal men are to make us think that. Now, in the introduction, the next thing she does, apart, apart from this great theorizing, is she has objections. So she does this sort of self-analysis, self-reflection, and she talks it through of what she's thinking about, um, and it tells us about how, what she thought as she did the work. She says, uh, there are some objections sustained and overruled. So portraying men as the enemy. And really nicely, she goes, this has caused me little loss of sleep. Um, she says that most of the women in this 400 years of writing didn't mind either. They, it just wasn't an issue. They didn't have to not portray men as the enemy. And many of them very explicitly said they are the enemy. So she just said, that's just overruled, no problem. If we portray men as the enemy, good. Studying women out of context. Now she talks about that. So some people object to the work that she's done in this book saying it's out of context. And she says that a lot of those objections are that the context that men want us to put women in is their context. So they want to be, when we say, for instance, talk about Simone de Beauvoir, we need to talk mostly about Sartre. Or if we talk about Mary Wollstonecraft, we need to spend a lot of time talking about her husbands and the men that she was, she was related to, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the context they, she, she, that, that we're meant to put them in that. And she, on purpose, says we're not doing that. We're in our own context. And the context that we're looking at is our perspective as women. And actually, these women wrote like that. So that's what they didn't bother about putting themselves in context. They were sort of saying our context is context. Now, another objection to her work that she identifies is treating all women the same. And she says, uh, this is on page 18, 19 of the book I've got. She says, 
I believe that diversity can be valued and built upon. And it is absolutely clear that there are differences. And she says, colour, class, culture, sexual preference, age, disability, um, amongst others. She says, yes, they're true. It's true. But she thinks that the women share a common I'm going to read she says I do suspect that women share a common frame of reference and because I think it is subversive and empowering to emphasize unity and its positive nature I have tended to treat women as a group in contrast with and often in conflict with men so it's very interesting that she's saying I've made the choice partly based on because it's subversive and empowering to emphasize our unity that's what I'm doing which is I, I haven't seen that explicitly written and I you know I think that's a really nice way I suppose I just agree with that then um, uh, limitations of the sample she says well it's true she hasn't covered everybody throughout history she only managed 140 women. She says, yeah, fair enough. It would have been better if there were more. The Western world, she says, most of her analysis is of women in the Western world. And the, the, she's covered a little bit of French, uh, sort of Simone de Beauvoir um, and Olympe de Gauche. Now, unfortunately, I've run out of time for my little bit. I'm going to whiz through. I'm going to take about three minutes for the rest of the bit that I'm I should be talking about really summarizing. Okay, so there's a fantastic introduction, very interesting in itself. Then she talks about Afra Ben. Afra Ben was writing at, uh, in the 17th century, about 1640 onwards, and she was an incredibly famous playwright. She was she wrote from a women's perspective, and she had 17 plays performed in the West End. Many of the plays were really successful. She made, she's the first, well, it says here, she's the first woman to make money. And she criticized sexual politics. She criticized men, she criticized the power. She refuted the allegations that she was uneducated. She didn't know Latin. She said, it's ridiculous to say, I'm no good because I didn't learn Latin. You won't let women learn Latin. How absurd. And she ridiculed the, the men, which is great. She was really popular with women. She took, uh, she talks about sexual politics and uh, she was very funny. Um, and then uh, it's discussed about how she's been sidelined. We don't learn about her. We should, we should all women and females should learn about Afro Ben. Uh, and should know her work because it's, it's fantastic. She's been criticized for being, uh, rude, sort of swearing quite a lot. And then uh, Dale Spender was saying everybody swore, swore then. All those um, Shakespeare and that lot, Chaucer, they were all swearing the whole time. They criticised her sexuality because she wasn't properly married. She's in the tradition of Wollstonecraft, etc., of saying she didn't agree with it. So that. Then Wollstonecraft, in the next chapter, we've got Wollstonecraft and she, the main thing I think that I took from the beginning of the Wollstonecraft stuff is that she wasn't alone. She's been portrayed as being a lone voice, the first one, and and then sort of like possibly just got it all from John Stuart Mill. And it's sort of like, you know, they they blur into starting to talk about him. Uh, what Dale Spender does is she says there's just loads of them. They were friends. They read each other. There's some fantastic writers before her, like Mary Astle and Sophia, who made the arguments that we've been making in the last few decades. Um, and she gives us access to be able to and makes it exciting, makes us want to read them. So the last one I just want to mention because it's so amazing, it's so inspiring, is Olympe de Gouges in France, in the French, in the French Revolution. She could see the revolution wasn't going very well and she wrote, it, this is what Dale Spender says, she covered the walls of Paris with bulletins signed with her name, expounding her ideas and exposing the injustices uh, of the new government towards women. She was sentenced to death by Robespierre and guillotined, but not before she had demanded to know of the women in the crowd. So she shouted out to the women in the crowd, what are the advantages you have derived from the revolution? <laughs> this is like such a hero. And we don't know that. We don't know that. We're like amazing that, well, I do now, we do now. But isn't that brilliant that Olympe de Gauche was so brave and so insightful and she spoke to women, you know, just as she was being killed for her revolutionary brilliant feminist act. Okay, so it's, I think I'm handing over to Emma now for, um, uh, for you, you telling us your insights and your bid.
Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, sorry I'm late, everyone. Um, so, yeah, that was a really good introduction, Joe. I, I feel the same way that um, another thing I like about her writing is she's unapologetic about the um, stories that she tells. The way she writes is, like, as you say, Joe, um, she's, not, she's not really interested in pleasing men. She's not really interested in talking in their frames of references. Um, she's unapologetic about this. Um, so, yeah, I'll just take off where you uh, left off, um, Joe. And so in this section, the section of the book that I looked at, she, she was looking at the, the, the three um, suffragettes, um, uh, Anthony, uh, uh, so the third person is the person I, that I'm particularly interested in because um, so the third person is called Matilda Jocelyn Gage and she's the third person in the, the triumvirate, I, I think it's called, of Susan B. Anthony and um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And so we've all heard about the other two, but um, Gage is a really interesting character because she was, according to Dale Spender, made invisible um, compared to the other two. And one of the reasons that Dale Spender argues that she was made invisible was because she was more radical than the other two. And she was ostracised and marginalised within the suffrage movement because of her radicalism, even by the other two. So the disappearing of Gage was not just because of male historians, male literature um, experts, etc. It was also because of, um, and Spender actually targets um, Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony didn't like um, Gage's politics and she in fact omitted a lot of um, Gage's arguments in her writings and uh, was a participant in writing Gage out of history. So for Spender, learning about Gage was um, a, a reawakening, a sort of an enlightenment moment about Susan B. Anthony herself. So this um, Matilda Jocelyn Gage was, um, she was, uh, a lot of her activism was um, anti-Christianity. And at the time, this was very radical. And according to the other two suffragettes, um, it, it wasn't a good look. And this led to her being ostracised within the movement. So her, her firm belief that Christianity was actually at the heart of women's oppression actually uh, led to her being um, marginalised. She was also uh, uncompromising and urged other women to be uncompromising. She wasn't interested in being polite and this also caused her to be disliked by other um, women even in, within the movement and again it caused her to be rewritten, sort of written out of um, history. And something there's really interesting, really funny um, at sort of um, little story about how she was really anti-Christianity within, and she embodied it herself at an 1888 International Council of Women, which nearly 10,000 women attended from around the world. All the sessions would typically begin with a prayer. And Gage was the head, the, the, you know, the head of one of the panels, and she began her session with a prayer to a female deity. And this caused much consternation. So it was these sorts of things that she did that um, the rest of the movement weren't really on board with and didn't want to be associated with her. Um, so unfortunately, she was, for the most part, written out of history. Um, so when the, um, the union between the, uh, the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association, and the American Women's Suffrage Association was the one that was involved with the temperance movement. So it was a conservative um, group. And when they united, Initially, um, initially Stanton and Gage were opposed to the union, but then Gage woke up one day, the union had formed and Stanton was the um, head, head of the union. So there was a bit of a um, uh, backstabbing, I suppose, that happened. So, and because of this unfortunate relationship between the three of them, particularly between um, Anthony and Gage, um, Gage was forgotten about and but then Spender argues that because of the people like Gage who we don't really hear about very often the women's movement was in fact much more radical than 
we think it is or than the, the, the common narrative of the time would indicate. But because we don't hear about people like Gage, we're not aware of how radical, in fact, it was. So it wasn't, um, yeah. Um, so that, that one particular story that uh, about Gage was, uh, I, I wanted to share that with you. And um, in, in parallel to, oh, no, sorry, I'll move on to the next section. So the next, there's a little bit, of, there was a small section about black women that um, Dale Spender, um, it's just a small section, but she uh, she sort of has a moment of self-reflection to say that um, even though, you know, like I might be, because I'm a white person talking about black women who have been not really talked about much at all, I might be skewing their stories, but at the same time, she was unapologetic in saying, at least I'm telling them, which is more than what most people are doing. So <clears throat> she talks mainly about uh, three women. One of them was Ida B. Wells. And Ida B. Wells observed herself in the late 1800s that black rights were going backwards. So this sort of taps into this narrative that Dale Spender weaves throughout the whole book that women's rights are not a clear and continual narrative and not a con continual progress. Similarly, black rights, the same thing happened. And this Ida B. Wells noticed that um, actually, in fact, after the Civil War, when um, some, some rights were, they got some rights after the Civil War, but then legal segregation actually spread in the Southern states and Ida B. Wells started fighting against that. <coughs> um, by this stage, the suffrage movement had become a little bit conservative and moved away from any association with black women, unfortunately. Initially, the suffrage movement was, um, um, led by a lot of women who were anti-slavery and a lot of the anti-slavery women became feminist and active in the women's movement. And another black woman that she talks about is Sojourner Truth. And we've probably all heard her name. And one of the um, reasons that Dale Spender gives for her being one woman who hasn't disappeared into the dustbin of history is that Sojourner Truth wrote her own autobiography and had it published in 1850, um, which was the was called the narrative of Sojourner Truth, a Northern slave. So perhaps this is some advice that we can take today to, if we don't want our or you know feminists of today, if if we don't want our work to disappear, taking ownership of it and writing our own autobiographies is one way of doing that. So Sheila Jeffries has done that already, and um, it's so that might be a way of um, doing that. I mean, it's not. We can't guarantee that people in the future will then misinterpret those um, autobiographies, but at least it's out there in our words. Um, okay, so and next, okay, so then she moves to she moves to Great Britain, and um, have, have I got time off the time? It's I've, I've got a couple of minutes left, um, and she so she talks about uh, the women's movement in uh, the Victoria era. And who will I talk? Okay, so I'll talk about uh, who will I talk about? I'll talk about so Anna Wheeler was the first person she talked about, and uh, she mentions that Anna Wheeler was actually quite radical. And after Anna Wheeler, she says she thinks that things went downhill, and in fact, the women's movement became more conservative after Anna Wheeler. And um, so she urges us to not believe the narrative that the women's movement is a continual linear narrative of progress. But um, uh, so, yeah, so as Joe said at the beginning, this book is a, a rewriting of history of women who have been forgotten, but also it's a rewriting of the women that we already know from different angles. So, for example, Florence Nightingale is one woman she talks about in this section of the book. And it's funny, she, she, the, the subtitle is, because we all know about Florence Nightingale as this maternal woman with a lamp. The subtitle she's called is, is called The Lady Without the Lamp, Florence Nightingale. <laughs> so I love how she, she um, subverts all these um, things. So Florence Nightingale apparently uh, was very uh, strident in arguing that, uh, arguing against marriage. So marriage in Victor the Victorian era was 
appalling for women, right? So as soon as a woman got married to a man, she lost all her property. And um, it was very difficult to get divorced. Uh, it, was, it was a disaster for women. No, nonetheless, it was still idealised as a woman's role in life. So Florence Nightingale argued against it. Um, and she said that in marriage, we can see that not only women, not only do women have to be slaves, they have to be willing and happy, happy slaves. So this is quite a radical idea that I think even if we say this today, people are like, oh, no, no, marriage is about romance and love. Um, whereas there were, and Florence Nightingale is not the only woman who was very, very critical of marriage. In fact, in, in the same section, there were other women, for example, uh, I think it was Lydia, Lydia Becker um, and uh, Josephine Butler, very, very critical of marriage, equating it to prostitution, uh, which again, even today, when we make arguments like this, people are horrified. Um, but th these arguments were being made in Victorian um, England. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> Have I run out of time or can I? Uh, am I no, you've got three more minutes. Oh, three more minutes. Okay. So I'll just pick a couple of interesting ones here. Um, uh, okay. So Lydia Becker was... Um, she was involved in the um, yeah. She was involved in um, women's suffrage, but also uh, the argument against marriage. And and what I found interesting about um, her story, or the way that um, Spender talked about Lydia Becker, was that one of the reasons she disappeared into history was because one, she was a spinster, and whenever she's written about, it's written, she's written about in very dour terms. So she was, you know, and uh, unsexed. She was a spinster. She wasn't very good looking. And, she, you know, she went about her um, business very, in, in a very sort of um, clinical way. So Spender argues that um, a lot of these women are written about in stereotypical ways as, as though they're, you know, they have really nothing in their lives. They, they couldn't get married. They have no sex life. They're not attractive. Um, and therefore she, you know, they dress severely. And she calls this sexual harassment, historical sexual harassment. And this is the sort of one of the theoretical lens that she uses throughout the book that uh, they were harassed in their, in their own time, but they've been harassed also by writers, historians, who look back and tell their stories, this historical sexual harassment, which uh, denies women any existence other than that of sex object, was what she said. And women who protest about men and who have lived without men are prime targets for male abuse. So this is in their day, but also um, after when they're being written and told about, told stories about. And then there was um, Josephine, Oh, actually, while I'm at, so, so, so while I'm on Lydia Becker, there was an, a biography written about her in 2022, in fact, published this year. And this happened, this happened with quite a few of the women that Spender deals with in this book. I actually sort of Googled a lot of them. And since Spender's publication, quite a few of them have had biographies or other things, actual books written about them. So I, I, I mean, it's hard to sort of prove causal, you know, any causal relationship. But I, I think um, Dale Spender's probably done what she wanted to do by lifting these women out of obscurity and getting people interested in knowing more about them because more actual um, whole studies of them have appeared since then. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. And um, Dorothea, you can... Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pick out just a, a couple of themes from the section on the 20th century, because obviously there's, there's so much there. But um, there's a nice bridge from what uh, Emma was just saying about the, the description of women, um, you, you know, in very negative terms. It carries on. And this was particularly one of the weapons that was used against the militant suffragette movement. But not just at the time. It's carrying on in, into contemporary times because um, um, Spender looks at some of the 
you know, more recent books written about the suffrage movement and biographies of um, the Pankhurst women. And it, they are determined to show them as unpleasant characters, you know, to talk about the work of the Pankhurst as a family psychodrama rather than, you know, committed political activists that, you know, develop strategy and, and, and um, achieve change, which she says, it reveals more about the fears of the authors than the lives of the women they profess to portray. Um, and she also, you know, highlights that one of the reasons that, that the Pankhursts and other militants um, have been so misre misrepresented and maliciously maligned is because they are independent from men, which then is, is you know, labelled man-hating. Um, and I think it's the same as with um, Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Some of the more, you know, liberal, you know, conformist women are accepted, but any woman that is too radical, too outspoken, too critical of the patriarchy is pounced on as an extremist. And pressure then often put on on other women to distance themselves from that. And it, you know, it happened in the split in the in the suffrage movement. And we can obviously see it um, happening now. I mean, that's one of the things I really like about this, this book, sort of reading it, you know, in the midst of the current backlash, you can absolutely see how the same techniques that were used, you know, 100 years ago against women are being used against us now. Um, yeah, so, um, it, the, the biographers of, of the Pankhurst ignore that it was about the refusal of male politicians to um, do anything uh, about the vote that women were forced to become militant. Um, it, it was a reaction to, uh, to the, the male dismissal of the movement. But then, of course, they were damned for going too far, for being violent and aggressive. And again, their meetings were violently attacked. Um, suffrage demonstrations were attacked in the streets. You know, it's again, you know, what, what we're going through now. Um, one of the things that Spender says um, none of these male writers can account for is why the suffrage movement was so popular and attracted so many women to be active, despite all the attacks in the press. You know, they were prepared not just to sign a petition or, you know, attend a meeting. They, they were prepared to, you know, damage property, be arrested, go to prison, go on hunger strike and be forcibly fed, which is some, um, you know, major commitment. And what she points out, you know, is that these men cannot understand, which is absolutely crucial, is that there is a joy in defiance, there is a joy in, in action, uh, there's a joy in feeling that you're making a difference in, and achieving something. And absolutely, it is about working together with women, it is about, it is about the sisterhood, and that absolutely needs to be um, remembered. And then the, the other thing um, which she points out again is very relevant to, to now. Um, it is divisions among women, not alliances, that are facilitated in a male-dominated world. When women put their energy into other women and find the process satisfying and replenishing, where does that leave men? It's not just that they are no longer central to women's existence, which may be a blow to their pride and promote an identity crisis. It is also that women's resources are not available for men for the taking. It should be no surprise that women only groups should constitute a considerable threat to the patriarchy, which is what we're in, in the middle of now. Um, I mean, she does also pick up why some of the um, divisions between women help and why, you know, a subsequent generation of women may ignore the, the contributions of, of earlier women. Yeah, she points out that what that, you know, it is in the interest of patriarchy to create divisions between women. And one of the major ones that they create is to exploit ageism against older women so that younger women don't want to have anything to do with older women because women are only valued for our appearance, our sexual availability, ability to have children. So therefore, older women have have no value. Um, so, yeah, it's a ageism happens and she's aware that that is starting. You know, that was a trap that they were falling into um, in the second wave and she finds a quote from, from Rebecca West saying that, you know, no one's from Women's Lib have ever show, shown the slightest interest in me. That was Rebecca West in 1975. And one of the things that Dale Spender did following up to, from this book was actually go and interview a lot of these women that were still alive and get an all history of women's movements between 
the, the end of the, the suffrage campaign and, and the, the second wave, which is called There's Always Been a Women, Women's Movement This Century, which again is another, another good read for anybody with the slightest interest in, in women's history. The other thing that she's very keen to point out in the for the 20th century is that the writers were very radical um, in, in the terms of the second wave. It's not just about equality and, and the vote. She's very clear that writers like Charlotte Perkins Gilman were developing analyses of male power about women in the econ you know, in the economy and the role of domestic labor that were very close to the ideas of the second wave. So Gilman in, in Women in Economics was absolutely clear that marriage was an economic relationship. And that was because men had power and made economic arrangements which maintained that power. Women work, but it doesn't count as work. And the work benefits the man and the overall uh, wider economy, which is you know, it's very similar to wage, you know, arguments that were made, say, by the Wages for Housework campaign um, in, in the 1970s. And they realised that this makes marriage a necessity for women, not a choice. You know, it's kind of deconstructing the, the idea that we, you know, women naturally want, want to get married. Um, and she actually was promoting the idea of women living communally and, and collectivising housework. Um, as an alternative to that, saying that, you know, women supporting women is the means by which women will recognise their potential and realise their power. Um, she also had, you know, an, an understanding of the impact of domestic confinement on, on women, um, which again is, is sort of similar to the ideas that Betty Friedan wrote about in, in the early 60s, about being, you know, being confined to the home, um, being terrible for women. And the reason why Spender wants us to realise that and, and not lose all this is obviously how much more progress would we, be uh, would we have made if women weren't having to write, the, you know, similar books and say similar things every 50 years or so, if we could actually have continued to build on, you know, what had, what had gone before. Um, but again, the, the, you know, she was dismissed. And again, it, this shows how the way that women dismiss, are dismissed it's always there, but it can change over time. So in the 19th century, arguments from a religion were often used to say, oh, you know, women's role is natural. They, you know, it's natural that they get married. It's natural that they stay, they stay in the home. God, you know, God meant it to happen. That was less, you know, sort of, um, you yeah, know, been a lot of re rejection of religion uh, by, by the sort of 20s and 30s. So they used, used Freud instead. They came up with a new sort of God to, to sort of bash women with. Um, and so they actually made personal attacks, again, on a lot of these women, the same as, as in the 19th century. So if you criticise heterosexuality, you're prude, you're frigid, you're repressed, you, you know, you haven't adapted to your proper role, um, you know, immature, all, all these things you used against the, these women. But women were also very... Um, clear that um, Freud was no good for women right you know right from the start you know Viola Klein said that um, Freud started from um, an assumption of male supremacy and constructed his argument to fit it and you know made men responsible for civilization and and everything else um I need a, I, can I I'll just, there. I'll yes. just add something while you're taking <laughs> yeah. breath it. um a thing that it, 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 there's a couple of things. One is yeah. it's really wonderful reading Dale Spender because she's a wonderful writer and fun. And you feel as if you have uh, wise friends with a, an amazing political analysis uh, taking you through this this 400 years of history, our, our women's writing and analysing and making really interesting comments. So. I've, and then another thing I felt is that I feel like that she is making the links between women saying the, the, the it's been said before many, many times and that she's showing it like a relay race of one woman passing the baton. They did read each mm. other. They weren't alone. They, it's a complete myth that they were separate. Most of them, almost I think all of them were linked up and were in touch with the <laughs> other's ideas. Very, very, almost none of them 
were individuals. And she talks about in, in the beginning, this very interesting thing about how when we work as a community, we come up with different forms of ideas. She talks about how when writing, we could consider having doing more footnoting and referencing where we got the ideas from. And that's something that I sort of noticed very clearly in Mary Daly, who Dale Spender had read her book, Not Gynecology, when she before she wrote this and was talking a lot about the traditions and linking knitting all these women together and and acknowledging that she got the idea from a conversation with somebody she said we could creatively think about making making ideas as a as a collective or a community together rather than doing it in this individualistic way but certainly she said she said lots of them couldn't have done it if they were on their own it's this discussion that makes us one understand things more fully but go forwards with ideas and I think it's so nice that we're here we've got this brilliant chat going on and that we're using a new form of technology but the traditions of our movement to um to do even more of that of that knitting together and having a really rich understanding but sort of helping each other develop our ideas um, so that's that's something I completely love about it. Oh, and back to either Emma or or Dorothy. Yeah. yeah I mean, I've got some. Think, oh, Dorothy. You oh, no, go, go on, Emma. Go on, and then I'll I've got some stuff that to kind of finish it off on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think the um, point about the um, technology is really interesting, Joe, because when Dale Spender wrote this book, obviously she you know did amazing archival research and relied on books and archives and newspapers. She tells a, a funny, well, it's kind of tragic story about Joseph. She found an autobiography of Josephine Butler when she was doing her research. She came across this autobiography in a garage sale for five pence. So, and that's how sort of of little value that Josephine Butler's autobi oh, sorry, biography was. But since then, obviously, Dale Spender has written this book and also 2014 another biography about her came out um, but with technology with the technology that we've got now you know what we're doing this this is YouTube this is getting on YouTube and it's going to be there forever maybe and <laughs> so the type of research that people do in the future is going to be quite different and the availability of um, feminist work I think is much more open I mean, I don't know, it, it might, I don't know, I hope that that's a good thing. I mean, it might just mean that there's, there's more to scour through, but um, at least there's more availability, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, one thing I think is the problem with different new forms of silencing that's uh, in academia, uh, it would be reasonably taboo to uh, mention that you know about all of the stuff that we talk about mm -hmm. because it's uh, scorned and you'd be outing yourself as uh, to be shunned. Mm -hmm. um, from what I can see, they don't mind just referencing very gently, but um, that th in schools and in academia, um, they've they've sort of basically made it completely taboo to talk about this bit of feminism and all just all the nonsense stuff. So that's a big problem. And there are lots of mm. other methods that are being used. Well, lots of them, as we know. OK. Yeah. yeah and all, all the same ones. So, yes, we need to learn from this and come up with our strategies for, for challenging it. So. Um, I was just going to wrap it up with a bit about um, what some of Dal Spender's ideas are for how how we, we tackle this. As I say, she sees this as you know political project. It's not just um, just history. Um, she's clear that the invisible invisibility of women is not a byproduct of patriarchy, but a foundation stone of it. To challenge the patriarchal representation of women is to challenge patriarchy at its roots. Um, this is a common and central idea among the women who have questioned male power and been victims of it as they have fulfilled patriarchal expectation and disappeared. From Afra Ben to Adrian Rich, it has been suggested that among the most subversive and powerful activities women can engage in are the activities of constructing women's visible and forcible traditions, of making real our positive experience of celebrating our lives and of resisting disappearance in the process. So she says then later 
um, on that page. She, I'm advocating the premise that knowledge is political. I am, I am asserting that in a male-dominated society, women do not control the uses that are made of knowledge. So therefore, she feels that we need to do a knowledge strike. Um, as, so not to not write and think, but not to do it within the male framework and to concentrate on centering women, celebrating women, you know, amplifying women's voices as, you know, as we're doing here. And that's something that was advocated prior um, to her by um, Virginia Woolf quite famously in, in Three Guineas, but also by a less well-known um, writer in, in the sort of 1940s and 50s, uh, Mary Ritter Beard who wrote a book on women as, as a force in history um, and that was one of the inspirations for Gerda Lerner's work but one of the things that Spender says that women's books don't fit male categories because of course male males write the categories um, and she, she they're not grouped together as feminists and she would love to enter the British Library and find feminist non-fiction grouped together now I don't know whether that has has happened yet but uh, you know it's it's something that we need to do it's something that previous attempts have not always worked um beard tried to get better coverage of women encyclopedias and, and was rejected tried to set up an archive um and was rejected we've got some of those things now but they're under threat the feminist library in london refused to let philia take out historical materials to display at their conference last year because it's been controlled by a type of feminist that you know rejects our analysis of, of feminism so it's a it's an ongoing struggle um i hope we're all trying to you know sort of uh, you know play our bit in in you know doing something for it and yeah i, I as I, say, I just recommend I recommend Dale Spender's work generally she she also did I didn't I haven't read it yet but again I found it on eBay at a, at a cheap price it's called for, for the record the making and meaning of feminist knowledge and it was published in the 1980s and and she's writing about you know the contemporary feminist writers um so I'll have a read of that over the next few weeks and uh, see what we make of that so anyway that's enough from me <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would say uh, I agree. I think that um, reading the book, I haven't I haven't finished reading it. Um, I'm going to now absolutely finish the end of it. So I just read the first uh, section of it is a joy as well as uh, very, very useful. I'm very interested in political strategizing about how we can use our time most effectively to overthrow the patriarchy. And um, I'm interested, really interested in theory, but what and one of the great things I like in this book is that Dale Spender says, OK, some some of feminists say that theory is elitist and we don't need it, you know, that because they've had such terrible male theory like Rousseau and people like that um, or Aristotle. And what she says is we have our own theories and they are in, in the, really different because they come from our perspective and they are completely valid and we should uh get you know get become very conscious of them and use them and use their strategies but then she says that within that you also have some very good points by uh Senate state Emmeline Pankhurst who said deeds not words and there are that that it's great because of these different levels it's it's the fact that she thought that up and said it or it's a good slogan um is part of our theoretical um tradition that the the doing things are, are is really important so uh it's just lovely the loads and loads of bits of complexity and so much we can learn from it in and really enjoy so over to you dalton uh emma dalton, <laughs> the last for the last word <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. That was, that was, you know, I, I agree. Um, and um, I love um, Dale Spender's humour. She's quite sardonic in quite um, a lot of the sections. Um, and that, uh, you know, we all know that feminism is, um, it, it's a, we're not a dour bunch. We're actually a really funny bunch. And she um, really shows that. Um, she can make these really strong and persuasive arguments but in the little footnotes she's just got these sort of tongue-in-cheek comments as well that make me laugh um but yeah I agree like I, I'm glad you picked this um Dorothea uh, um because 
she uh, unfortunately is one of sort of the semi-forgotten feminist she because um of what she says because that she has been invisibilized and forgotten deliberately so i'm glad that um you brought this book up so we could talk about another one of hers and bring her work out into the light okay so we've come to the end of the hour thank you so much to everybody for coming we've got breakout rooms so the breakout room link that we use for the normal fqt uh, we hope they're going to work. Uh, Claudine is going to open them. Um, if they don't work, uh, keep trying for a bit and then apologies if they don't, but we think they will. Um, and see you next week. We're going to do the sexual contract uh, by Carol Pateman next week, which is another uh, mind-blowingly brilliant book. So thanks so much for coming and see you next week. Bye. <laughs>